Okay. okay. Great, so let me get us started. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us uh, this week. And I'm pleased to introduce our VAMOS uh, speaker for today, who is Tom Beinacht from SUNY Stony Brook. Now, there has been some confusion about how to pronounce Tom's last name. Um, I have on good authority that the correct pronunciation is Weihnacht, as in the wine that you drink at night, uh, for example, while you're waiting for election returns. So just to drill this into everybody's mind so that there's no further mispronunciations, let me, let me ask uh, actually that the entire Vamos panel uh, just unmute themselves briefly and, uh, and then repeat, repeat uh, Tom's name. Tom, would you pronounce it for all of us? We'll just repeat it. I hope that other people were warned about this, but sure, it's Weihnacht. Okay, let's do it. One, two, three. Weihnacht. 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 That's beautiful. Okay, so I'll go on. Professor Weihnacht works in the area of optical coherent control and uh, explores its utility in measuring and controlling dynamics in atomic and molecular systems. And uh, this is a field where he is using uh, shaped ultra-fast laser pulses to do this manipulation and measurement. Um, uh, Tom's PhD uh, is from uh, the University of Michigan where he worked with uh, Phil Buxbaum while Phil was there. Uh, Tom was awarded the 2001 Damoff Thesis Prize for that, for that work. Uh, thereafter, he went to do a postdoc continuing in uh, ultra-fast optics working with uh, Margaret Murnane and Henry Captain at, uh, at Jilla. And then finally in 2002, he uh, moved to his present position at uh, the University of, uh, the SUNY University in Stony Brook. Um, Tom is uh, an APS fellow since 2012 and a noted expert in his field. So it's uh, great to have him here as part of the VAMOS uh, series. Let me just quickly remind the audience that we, um, we eagerly uh, invite your questions. You can enter those questions uh, here on the Zoom channel in the Q&A box. You can also enter them on the uh, YouTube live stream. And there will be uh, a couple of breaks in the middle of the talk before the final questions are asked at the end. So uh, keep those questions coming. Tom, go ahead, please. All right, great. thanks a lot for the introduction and for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to give this talk. Um, and, uh, and I look forward to questions um, as we go. Can everybody see my pointer? I guess, um, right, okay, good. So, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, coherent or quantum control of non-adiabatic dynamics and molecules. And there's different um, uses of the term non-adiabatic. Um, one can think about non-adiabatic response of an electric or of an electron to an electric a field applied to a molecule, or one can think about non-adiabatic dynamics where you have um, the electron unable to follow adiabatically the motion of the nuclei in a molecule. And I'm going to be addressing both, and there's an interplay of both of those types of non-adiabatic dynamics um, in the experiments that I'm going to tell you about. So um, just go to the next slide. <clears throat> what I, I want to motivate the talk by, um, by the idea of trying to follow and control electronic motion in atoms and molecules. So I'm going to be talking mostly about wave packets, that is time-dependent states, which you can write as superpositions of eigenstates of the system. And in some of my PhD work with Phil Buxbaum many years ago, we worked on controlling wave packets in atoms. And we took Rydberg atoms and we prepared superpositions of eigenstates that create a wave function like this, which is a superposition of um, several principal quantum number states of uh, cesium atom. Um, and the color represents the phase of the wave function. And the amplitude represents just the um, uh, square root of the probability distribution. Contrasting that here on the right is um, snapshots of an electronic wave packet in a series of, in a water cluster where you've taken an electron out of the highest occupied molecular orbital and um, then are looking at snapshots of what that density looks like as a function of time. And this highlights one of the key points that I'm gonna be coming back to in the talk that wave packet dynamics or electronic wave packet dynamics in atoms and molecules are quite different um, because of the participation of the nuclei. And if you can't assume that the electrons are always adiabatically following the nuclei, then that complicates the situation and makes life actually quite interesting. Um, so if we look at how we can write down the, um, the wave function here, 
In the case of the atom, I can simply write down a, a, a coherent superposition of eigenstates. And the time dependence in this wave function just comes from the evolution of the phase of each eigenstate relative to the others. And in a similar fashion, I can write this molecular wave function here in terms of a superposition of electronic states which evolve with some time dependent phase. But in this case, the coefficients that multiply those electronic states are actually functions themselves of the nuclear coordinates. That's what this chi here is. It's a nuclear wave function which depends on both space and time. I'm using the large R to represent nuclear coordinates and small r to represent the electronic coordinates. <clears throat> so that gets us a little bit into this idea of what electronic coherence is, because it's basically the underpinning of all electronic dynamics. That is a coherent superposition of two electronic states. And the basic problem is basically illustrated here in this diagram, um, which is taken from this very nice paper of Robin Santos from three years ago. Um, so the idea is that if I excite a wave packet that is some sort of time dependent um, electronic and uh, a superposition of electronic states that also involve superpositions of vibrational states on those electronic potentials. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. But I just wanted to give you a sort of a pictorial representation of the problem, which is that if I create some time dependent wave function by excitation with the laser pulse here, that wave function is displaced from the equilibrium of some excited state and will therefore move. And as it moves, the separation between the electronic states is dependent on nuclear coordinate. And that means that the phase dependence of these two wave functions here is not well defined if one doesn't consider a specific nuclear coordinate. And so averaging over those nuclear coordinates means you average over the phase and you lose the electronic coherence. So that's sort of one of the main points that I wanna get at is the loss of that coherence, um, how to mitigate that and how to measure it. Because it's the coherent superposition that makes an electronic wave packet. It's what results in electronic motion. And so if that's lost, then how can we think about the motion of electrons and molecules? So a little bit of a background um, before going into the research results. <clears throat> We can write down a molecular Hamiltonian, something like what's given here. And these terms simply represent kinetic energy for the electrons, potential energy for the electrons, kinetic energy for the nuclei, um, the potential energy for the nuclei, and the interaction between the electrons and the nuclei. This is what's responsible for the bonding. Um, so this is you know, a, a relatively straightforward thing that we can write down for any molecule. Unfortunately, we can't solve it exactly, that is, we can't solve for the eigenstates of this system exactly. And the usual thing that we'd like to do, which is to make a separation of um, uh, the wave function in terms of different coordinates, similar to the way you solve the wave function for the hydrogen atom. Um, we try and have an onsatz or a guess of a separable wave function, one that's an electronic portion and one that's a nuclear portion. Um, little r represent the electronic coordinates again and large r the nuclear ones. Then the Born-Oppenheimer approximation is to basically say, look, we can try and write separable wave functions like this um, <clears throat> and see if we can plug them back into the equation and find solutions to the equation like that. And it turns out that you can't do that because when you basically do that, there are terms in this Hamiltonian um, that, uh, that couple these states. And so you have to always think about superpositions of these product states. So let's consider a particular superposition like the most simplest thing you can think about for H2 plus. And so we have the ground state and first excited state of that molecule. And we can consider a, a nuclear wave function on each of these electronic states. And um, <clears throat> so these electronic states you get by basically solving the time independent Schrodinger equation for the electrons. And then I can sort of have a, um, uh, uh, a nuclear wave function that evolves on this sort of electronic potential energy surface or curve in the case of one dimension. And so I can think about there's a, an electronic wave function which is shown here for the ground state, an electronic wave function for the excited state. And you can see that here's a bonding um, wave function and here's an anti-bonding wave function. And in general, the superposition of these guys is then the electronic ground state times the vibrational wave function there plus the electronic excited state times the vibrational wave function there. 
And this general kind of wave function is basically not a separable one because I have to take a sum of products and that's going to be what we're interested in the rest of the talk. So <clears throat> what I want to point out in this slide is that in molecules, it's, it's sort of an interesting thing that there's a qualitative difference from a one dimensional case, like what I was just describing H2 plus, for instance, and polyatomic systems where we have more than one degree of vibrational freedom. And I think for me, the most intuitive way to understand this is to think about the non crossing theorem, um, which is that typically if you have two electronic states that have some sort of coupling them between them, which I can represent as some sort of a matrix like this. And I can think about a ground state energy and an excited state energy. And then these are two couplings that come about because of the violation of the born oppenheimer approximation. Essentially, there are terms in the molecular Hamiltonian that couple those states. And these come from um, basically the derivatives of the electronic wave function with respect to nuclear coordinate. They're small, but non-zero. And so if we try and diagonalize this the way that you would normally try and do any kind of diagonalization of a two-level problem with coupling, then the energy difference between the two states when you do that diagonalization is given by an expression like this, where RD is sort of at some point where we might have a degeneracy um, between the two levels that we're talking about. So imagine two levels that are here schematically shown like this. The point that I want to make is that for the degeneracy to be lifted <clears throat> or for there to be a true degeneracy at that point, both of these terms, because they're the sum of the square of two independent terms, have to vanish. And those generally will not vanish. And so um, you always have an avoided crossing. And so if I diagonalize the system um, with this matrix here, then I get something that's non-zero separation between the ground and excited state, even at a point where these two potentials might have been equal to each other. However, if you do it in more than one dimension, then wherever you might find that you have a degeneracy which is lifted by the coupling, you have other degrees of freedom which you can go along where you can find another independent vanishing of these terms. And so that's sort of illustrated by the movie I'm going to show right now, which is basically scanning through a two dimensional potential. And the red lines here at the edges indicate just as I scan along one vibrational coordinate, what the energy is. And what you can see is that if I scan appropriately, I can find places in the potential where I actually have a real degeneracy right here, for instance. And so what that's supposed to illustrate is that maybe along one coordinate, I'm scanning like up here, and I find that the degeneracy is lifted when I diagonalize. But then if I have another degree of freedom available, I can scan along that and find that the degeneracy cannot be lifted. And so then I actually get a real crossing between potential energy surfaces. And if you think about the Born-Oppenheimer approximation as um, <clears throat> sort of the electrons not able to um, uh, adiabatically follow the nuclei. People frequently talk about this in terms of a sort of a time scale argument that the uh, electrons are fast and light and they can always follow these slow, heavy nuclei. And if they can do that, then I can really sort of separate my wave function along the lines that I do. However, the time scales we know in quantum mechanics are always given by energy differences. And so if I think about an energy difference between electronic states, that's typically very large, sort of EV type scale for a molecule, if you think about ground and first excited state. And the spacing between vibrational states is orders of magnitude smaller. So that sort of argument seems to work, right? Because you'd say, oh, okay, if I have very large splitting between electronic states, that means that I have very fast motion and the nuclei have much smaller splittings between the states, very slow motion, so the electrons can always follow. However, at a conical intersection, that is grossly violated because the splitting between the electronic states goes to zero. So <clears throat> at those points, what that means is that basically you can have very strong coupling between the electronic states due to the non-adiabatic dynamics. So let's just sort of review two or look at two specific examples. And one of them is the famous case of sodium iodide, which about 20 years ago, 
um, was um, some of the most important work that resulted in the Nobel Prize in Chemistry going to Ahmed Zawail for his pioneering experiments in um, time result spectroscopy. And there um, he looked at this sort of harpooning reaction where there was a wave packet excited on this excited potential here and going back and forth, there was some coupling between these two potentials because the gap was very small. But um, the point is that if you took the diabatic states, diagonalized the Hamiltonian along the way we talked about, then there's an avoided crossing here. If we look at a comparable case for a molecule that's more complicated like pyrazine, here is a very beautiful picture taken from um, research work of Toshinori Suzuki where you can sort of see what the qualitative difference in looking at a higher dimensional case. Now, obviously, if you look at this molecule, you can clearly see that it has many more degrees of freedom, three and minus six vibrational degrees of freedom than just two. And so we, but it's very difficult for us to visualize all of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what I'm showing you is a two dimensional sort of subspace where we can look at and see this conical intersection. In higher dimension, of course, these are all seams, sort of n minus two dimensional seams in an n dimensional space. But this is a nice visualization where you can imagine a wave function getting sucked into this funnel and basically going from one electronic state to another. That's qualitatively different from an atom. If I excite an atom and it's just sitting alone by itself, the only way for it to go back down to the ground state is through sort of a radiative relaxation. But this is a non-radiative relaxation route that allows us to couple from an excited electronic state to a ground state or any other state of the system. So here's a movie that sort of illustrates how that looks like if you just solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, including the um, terms that uh, basically violate the onsets of the born oppenheimer approximation. So we're going to start with a wave function that's shown like this. It's on the same potential energy surface that I showed you earlier, this one here. And that surface has simply been rotated um, and plotted a little bit differently to facilitate the viewing of this movie. This sort of flagpole that I'm showing you here is the marks the location of the conical intersection between these two surfaces. So if I play the movie now, you can see the wave function is evolving, it's just moving down the potential energy surface as it seems naturally that it should. And <clears throat> there is some spreading, but what you can start to see is that there's a coupling between this potential energy surface and this one here that leads to some of this wave function resulting in the bottom potential energy surface. And if I propagate the movie further, you can see that the wave function goes from the excited state surface, part of it makes its way down to the ground state here. And that coupling is due to the terms that violate the Born-Oppenheimer approximation in the molecular Hamiltonian and can be thought of as sort of being localized at this conical intersection. Not everything happens at this one point, but that's sort of the focus where all the action is around that point. And you can see that the wave function on the ground state here is not just a little dot around this intersection, but is spread out and localized around that point. So these are important so when, when people first realized um, that there are such degeneracies between electronic states, it wasn't immediately recognized that they play an important role in everyday life or chemical dynamics or anything. But then people became to realize that increasingly that they are important because of their location in the potential energy surfaces relative to any point that you might excite the molecule. So now, for instance, it's understood that the photoprotection of DNA is facilitated through conical intersections. That is. If you go out into the sun and you absorb light from the sun at let's say 5 EV, that's plenty of energy to break bonds in all of the DNA in your skin and so on. And the rates at which we would get skin cancer if it weren't for the ability of the molecules in your skin to turn that 5 EV of dangerous electronic energy into heat, that is just to turn it into vibrations. Because as the wave function goes from an excited state to a lower lying electronic state, it converts all of this potential energy that's in the electronic wave function into nuclear kinetic energy. Well, if there are surrounding molecules, that's just heat. And so that's a much safer way to distribute the energy than in terms of the electronic excitation, which can lead to bond breaking. So that's just to point out that this kind of thing is extremely important in a lot of you know, um, uh, physics and biology 
outside of you know what you might think about in terms of sort of a gas phase H2 plus going on to H you know three molecule. Um, okay, so this movie got started a little bit before I was ready. So what I'm going to now put together is those two parts of the motivation to ask the following question. We see that electronic coherence is extremely important to understand electronic wave packets and motion of electrons in molecules. And we see that there is this non-adiabatic coupling between electrons and nuclei that lead to um, um, <clears throat> multiple electronic states being populated even when I excite to a given single one. So the question is, can this coherence between different electronic states survive coupling between those driven by non-adiabatic coupling? And that's what I hope to address in this talk. And then to try and understand to what extent can we follow electronic coherence after excitation and make sure that um, it's still there. So, so here, what we're gonna do is an experiment um, and we're gonna make use of very short um, and shaped laser pulses. And we're gonna excite molecules. We're gonna excite um, a series of homologous molecules that those are molecules that are sort of very similar um, but have some key differences that allow us to sort of test out um, ideas about mechanism. And the idea is to then <clears throat> excite and ionize these molecules and use the measurement observable of a photoelectron to try and determine what was the laser matter interaction um, and how did it depend on pulse shape. And if we can determine that, then basically we're doing a sort of a pulse shape spectroscopy where we're varying the pulse shape and measuring our um, observable, which is the photoelectron yield, as a function of pulse shape. And I want to sort of connect this to the sort of canonical experiment where I do a pump probe where I have two laser pulses separated by a delay. So we're going to try and use a pulse pair, but generated from our pulse shaper, which allows us to vary the relative phase between the two pulses in a very controlled and systematic way. And that's a little bit more difficult to do if you do not make use of an ultra-fast pulse shaper. And I'll talk about what I mean by ultra-fast pulse shaper in a moment. So we're going to excite a molecule to an excited state shown in green here. And I'm always going to be showing you one-dimensional cutouts of the potential energy surface to make um, uh, life easy to interpret. My colleague, Hal Metcalf, always has this beautiful um, the thing that he says about the uh, truth and clarity uncertainty principle. And so I'm erring a little bit here on the, hopefully in the area of clarity and sacrificing truth a little bit um, in order to give you a, a picture. But you can imagine that this is a, we're talking about a polyatomic molecule with, um, in this case, five atoms. We'll, I'll show you a picture in a moment of the, what the molecules look like. So this is just a one dimensional cut um, in order to facilitate the interpretation. So imagine that we take a laser pulse and we excite the molecule um, at zero time. And then we imagine the wave function evolves on the potential surface. And because of non-adiabatic coupling, you can see that we have a coupling between this wave function up here and we generate some wave function on the um, potential energy surfaces, which are non-adiabatically coupled to our initial excited state. And so what we're gonna be interested in is is there a well-defined phase relationship between this wave function and this one? And how long does that phase relationship, is it maintained? Um, okay, so I'm gonna say a, a word or two about the experimental tools, but um, since it's now about 325, um, at least East, East Coast time, maybe this is a good juncture at which to take any questions about the introduction and motivation. Um, so I'm happy to pause now. If there are no questions, I can go on. Um, we, have, we have a couple of questions. This is a good place to pause. I will say that the concept of a uh, truth, clarity, uncertainty principle is, is like a slogan for our time. So I'm gonna <laughs> write that one down. Um, okay, so our first uh, question comes from uh, Bill Phillips. Um, he's asking uh, if whether when you find a place where there uh, is a level crossing, does that uh, imply that you should uh, identify some symmetry that forbids the crossing, the coupling at that point? Um, so my under, okay, so th there are some rules about the symmetry, um, about symmetries that govern conical intersections, but 
I, my understanding is that there's not necessarily, so I, I basically, I don't think I know the answer fully to the question, but um, yeah. So I mean, I think, conical intersections occur, but it's not clear to me that they must occur. So right, you, know, right. you had this nice example of sort of scanning over one additional parameter and hoping that you'll find that at the line where the states are degenerate, you'll also find a place where the coupling is zero. But given that the coupling is a complex number, it's not obvious to me that it must necessarily go to zero anywhere. Yeah, no, the, the way that I really think about it, and which I've seen it presented also in many textbooks, is, <clears throat> is that it's essentially sort of like, not necessarily an accident, but it's not necessarily easy to, to, to determine exactly where they should be on some sort of a general argument. So in my collaborations where, um, so I, I have several collaborations with people who do electronic structure theory and, um, and they have to search for the intersections. So it's not sort of that they can say that they're obviously here or there. And it's a big question whether or not they're A, energetically accessible and B, um, dynamically accessible. And what that means is like, are they below the energy where you might excite? A, that's energetically and B, are there barriers in the potential energy curve that might stop mm. you from going there. So I think the answer is that there's not necessarily, they're not dictated by sort of simple generic rules or symmetries, but they can happen sort of quasi accidentally. Mm. Uh, okay. Yeah, because for me, a lot of my uh, intuition in this area maybe comes from uh, considering band structure, which is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, let's say in something like graphene where we find Dirac cones, mm -hmm. the argument for the existence of those cones is based on some underlying symmetry of the lattice. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the idea of, that it must be linked to a symmetry would come from. Let me ask you related to that. Um, so conical intersections are ones where the energy varies linearly as you go through the, the touching point between two potentials. Right. So are there also instances that you've encountered in molecular physics where those touchings are not linear, but there may be higher order where maybe the energy varies quadratically away from the touching point? So, so I, my understanding is that the simplest way to describe things is in terms of this linear variation. Um, we certainly it have- certainly would be the most common, but- I'm Right, so yeah. we, we certainly have not mapped it out in, a, in sufficient detail to sort of determine what the functional dependence is on coordinate. Um, so so I, I, basically I would say, I don't know because we, we don't have nearly the kind of sensitivity. You know, we've certainly identified them in the measurements and can basically unequivocally say that, oh yeah, there's, there is an intersection there. There is non abiotic coupling. I excite a state of a certain character and I can measure a state of a different one after some time delay. But I think it would take sort of a, an even more sensitive experiment to really tell you about the topology or the details of the of the surfaces right near the intersection. Although their topology is probably something that even an insensitive experiment would measure because it's such a robust signature. <clears throat> oh, you mean like the, the, the phase accumulated and going around? For example. Sure. Yeah. So, but, but, but to get, so our experiments are certainly not in a position to do that. Okay. All right, let me uh, let you go on and talk about your experiments. Okay, great. So um, so the, the two most e important experimental tools that I wanna sort of introduce are illustrated here. Um, one of them is, so I mentioned that what we do is, is, is ionization um, as our observable. And what we actually do is we map the um, photoelectrons and ions that we have, we map their momentum to a uh, two dimensional detector. And actually in some upgrades that we've had, we can actually measure the three dimensional momentum distribution of the generated ions and electrons subsequent to the um, interaction with the strong laser pulse. So what that means is that we essentially have like an electronic lens here, which then basically maps momentum to position on this detector. And if we take a picture of the, the microchannel plates are able to amplify the electrons or the ions by a factor of about a million, and then we have a phosphor screen, just like in an old TV set here. And then we have a camera, which takes a picture of that phosphor screen. That allows us to basically take a picture of the electronic wave function from this ionized molecule coming out towards the detector. I mean, it's essentially the, the free electron that we generate. And by measuring the momentum distribution of those free electrons, 
we can say something about the final state of the molecule. And by looking at correlations um, between uh, neutral and ionic states, we can say something about the intermediate states as well. I'll say a few details more about this coincidence velocity map imaging. The reason it's coincidence is because we do some rapid switching of voltages here so that we can collect both electrons and ions for each laser shot. And if we do it with sufficiently low molecular density here, then we can ionize a single molecule every laser shot and we can detect the ions and the electrons that come from that single molecule and um, put together a, a, a fairly you know, detailed picture of what final state we've created. The other important tool um, is that we have the ability to generate shaped laser pulses that are only a few cycles in duration. And the generating a few cycle pulse we do through some nonlinear optics that produces a very large bandwidth. And um, the shaping is done in what's known as an acousto-optic modulator pulse shaper. And I'll say a few words about that in a moment. So <clears throat> let me say something about velocity map imaging. So um, this is a, um, these are some measurements that we carried on in, um, in atomic argon for calibration purposes, which show you um, the full three-dimensional velocity distribution of the electrons that we generate. Then this next diagram here shows you a two-dimensional momentum slice of that distribution. If we integrate in the azimuthal direction, then this shows you the polar angle dependence. And what you can see here is some beautifully angular result features which come from resonant states that have high angular momentum that um, uh, facilitate the ionization. And finally, if we integrate over all of the polar angles, we generate what we think about in terms of the photoelectron spectrum. That is, what's the yield of the photoelectrons as a function of energy? And you can see a lot of structures here that you can interpret in terms of states of the argon atom that come into resonance in the strong field of the laser pulse. So um, <clears throat> this is sort of just to show you how we generate the photoelectron spectra that I'll be talking about. We measure the full three-dimensional velocity distribution or momentum distribution of the electrons. And then processing those, um, we can generate this photoelectron spectrum here. A few more words about the ultrafast pulse shaping that we do. Um, so if you're familiar with, with, with short laser pulses, then you know that the time scale for these is on the order of 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So um, this is not quite the atomic unit of time, but it's approaching it. And um, it's certainly fast enough to resolve vibrations in molecules, which are on the order of 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 13 seconds. So, so it's sort of those time scales which motivate us to work with these pulses. But if you're working with such short pulses, then changing the electric field in time is impossible. There's no electronics that works at those time scales. Um, and so we need to think about a, a trick. And the trick that we make use of is to do a Fourier transform. So for people who are in the optics business, you can do this with a grating and a curved mirror. So I Fourier transform my pulse by going off a grating which spreads all of the different colors in the pulse or frequency components to a different angle. And then with this curved mirror here at a focal length away, I now map that to position on some device here. And um, for those of you who work with acousto-optic modulators, this is a friendly face here, um, but this is a special acousto-optic modulator in that it has a very, very long acoustic aperture. And what we do is we launch an acoustic wave across there that is extremely long and can have very detailed control over the acoustic waveform. So what that means is that because the speed of light is so much greater than the speed of sound, the light goes through that acoustic wave before the acoustic wave can move. It's a sort of a frozen acoustic wave. And it can serve as a mask function, M here, which can modify the amplitude or the phase of any frequency component in our pulse. And because the Fourier transform is a one-to-one -one operation, what that means is we can produce a shaped electric field in the frequency domain, which Fourier transforms back with a subsequent curved mirror and grating into a shaped electric field in the time domain. So you put in some unshaped laser pulse and you get out anything that's consistent with the bandwidth and, and energy constraints that you had going in. So that allows us to use this sort of Fourier trick 
to now shape the pulse on time scales that are much faster than any kind of electronics or mechanical um, process that we can imagine controlling. And <clears throat> what that allows us to do is to do a sort of what I call pulse shape spectroscopy. And what I'd like to do is appeal to your probably familiarity with the normal sort of pump probe approach. So many people are sort of used to thinking about spectroscopy in the frequency domain. Okay, what we, we're, we're, you know, what, what's quantum mechanics good at is, you know, calculating eigenstates and eigenenergies. And so what's spectroscopy good at? It's measuring those eigenenergies. But um, in the case of systems which have very dense and um, overlapping absorption spectra, it's not particularly useful. So for instance, in condensed phase systems where you have broad absorption bands and inhomogeneous broadening, it's very difficult to infer any kind of molecular structure from, from an absorption spectrum. So time domain spectroscopy becomes um, a powerful tool in this case, where rather than doing my interrogation of the system in the frequency domain, I go to the time domain where I excite the molecule and I interrogate it with a separate probe pulse. So you can imagine that I have a sequence of pulses like this that are incident on my molecule. I excite a wave function here. That wave function can maybe move back and forth in this potential. And then I could ionize it producing some photoelectrons that I measure. And that's sort of the standard um, approach that has been, you know, um, used by people over the last two or three decades to interrogate time domain dynamics. And what I'm going to be sort of contrasting it with it here is now imagine that I have an arbitrarily shaped pulse. And I could imagine that I now consider exciting and ionizing my molecule all within a single pulse, which I've programmed for instance, by putting on a chirp, a time dependent frequency here, and then measuring the ionization yield as a function of this chirp or any other kind of pulse shape that I like. And this is all well and good, but the important part is the interpretation. Because you can think about both of these two ideas as falling under the following umbrella. What I'm interested in doing is looking at the nonlinear response of a molecular system to some electric field which varies as a function of a given chosen parameter. In the case of a pump probe experiment, I choose two different frequencies which might pick out particular electronic intermediate state and the final state, omega one and omega two, select that. And then I study the ionization as a function of this delta T so that I can map out the motion of a wave function in this intermediate state. And there's a very well-defined infrastructure, theoretical, that allows us to interpret that parameterization and that nonlinear experiment where we look at the shaped electric field and we look at the response of the molecular system to that. What the experiments that I'm going to tell you about now are trying to do is to develop an interpretation for a much more general kind of applied field. There are already some experiments that make use of this kind of idea. For instance, people who are familiar with the idea of two-dimensional electronic or vibrational spectroscopy are familiar with the idea that I can have higher order nonlinear processes that can probe more subtle aspects of the molecular Hamiltonian. So um, if I excite, for instance, molecules in a liquid at one frequency, and probe them at another one and use some third order um, susceptibility response, then I might get ideas about coupling between vibrational modes in the system. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to develop a better understanding of how a shaped pulse in general can drive competing dynamics and how we can interpret a measurement observable to infer what the dynamics were going on. So let's get a little bit more specific here. Um, because that's sort of a little bit general. The experiments I'm going to be talking about um, make use of strong field to drive some dynamics in a neutral and subsequently ionize within the same laser pulse, the molecule, to pr produce photoelectrons that we measure. So the idea is that if we come in with a short laser pulse, absorb multiple photons from our laser pulse, simultaneously, we can drive a wave packet on an excited state because we excite the molecule out of equilibrium. And <clears throat> here, for instance, in this molecule, which is a halogenated methane, it has two of the hydrogens replaced by heavier atoms, halogens like iodine and bromine, that allow us to sort of 
work a little bit more in the impulsive regime where our laser pulses are much faster than the intrinsic dynamics. Um, and the kind of motion that we excite is sort of ironically a wagging motion of the CH2 group here, as you can see illustrated. And then we subsequently ionize within the same laser pulse, the molecule to produce electrons and fragments of the molecule, which we detect with our velocity map imaging. This picture of the dynamics in this particular molecule was built up over several years with many papers that established what's going on. And I'm gonna show you some evidence to sort of back up that interpretation. So our measurement observable <clears throat> is the photoelectron spectrum. And what we found is that if we excite the molecules with a very, very short pulse, about 10 femtoseconds, which is about four cycles long, that time scale is faster than any vibrational period in the molecule. And so what we did then is we found that we were producing only a single peak in the photoelectron spectrum. That's illustrated by this blue line here. This shows you the raw image <clears throat> um, for actually for, for this case here, this raw image produces this blue photoelectron spectrum. And then if we make the pulse much longer, longer than 30 femtoseconds, then you can see that there are multiple peaks in the photoelectron spectrum. And that corresponds to multiple rings in our detected photoelectron momentum distribution. <clears throat> Each of these rings is a peak in this distribution. So there are some labels down here that I want to try and help identify and interpret using the energy conservation equation that's shown up here. So <clears throat> as a rough guide to what you can expect, the energy of a photoelectron, which is given here by epsilon, is given by n times the photon energy. So if we absorb, let's say, the photon energy is much smaller than the ionization potential. So here we think about it in terms of a multi-photon absorption. So if I take n times h nu, in this case, that integer is determined to be seven, and I subtract off the ionization potential, and what's known as the ponder mode of shift or the wiggle energy of an electron in a, a free electron in a strong laser field, then I can have a prediction for where I expect to have each of the um, states of the molecular cation. Um, and what that means is that these peaks all correspond to pulling out a different electron. This peak corresponds roughly to pulling out the highest occupied molecular orbital. So I take an electron from the valence shell, which is in the, in, the, in the orbital, which is most weakly bound, and I just pull it out. And that produces an electron with the highest energy because the laser doesn't have to put so much energy into ionizing, it can provide it with a lot of kinetic energy. If I pull out the next most weakly bound electron, that is a molecule or an electron from the HOMO minus one orbital, then I might produce this peak here. And then a subsequently more deeply bound electron produces a peak in the photoelectron spectrum here. So the, that sort of explains what's written here that the photoelectron spectrum labels the final state of the molecule. <clears throat> it tells us how did the molecular cation end up. And now what I wanna try and argue is how can we use what's known as Koopman's correlations to try and relate <clears throat> that final state of the molecule to an intermediate state um, upon which we might see some um, non-adiabatic dynamics. And the idea is shown here with this orbital occupation diagram. <clears throat> and as I illustrated, these the gray shaded ones here are the states of the molecular cation. The unshaded region below here are neutral states of the molecule. And these are all Rydberg states that are fairly high up. And what they are is they're correlated with specific states of the molecular cation. What does it mean to be correlated? Well, let's imagine that I excite a particular state of the molecule by taking an electron from the highest occupied molecular orbital, the HOMO, and putting it into some um, highly, um, well, some orbital which is um, significantly higher above it and has a very low binding energy. Let's say the lowest occupied molecular orbital, LUMO plus N. Now, if I ionize this molecule, which is in this excited state here, the easiest thing to do is to pull out the most weakly bound electron. That's this guy here. And so I'll be left with a molecule 
whose remaining electrons are just in this configuration. That's this state of the cation. And I can make a similar argument for exciting a Rydberg state where I took a homo minus one electron to that same orbital. And if I ionize that, I'll be left with this configuration. So this correlation is a multi-electron wave function overlap, but can be very easily understood in this sort of very simplistic picture that I've tried to show you here. And again, going back to how Metcalf's truth clarity, this is very much going towards clarity. You, you may argue with that <laughs> if it's not particularly clear, but, um, but it's a little bit not exactly true in that things are a little bit more complicated. There are multiple configurations involved, um, but I'm, I'm trying to simplify it to make it a little bit easier to digest. On the left-hand side, with the colors corresponding to the same as the orbital configurations, are shown the electronic state energies as a function of this wagging coordinate. And what I want to try and illustrate here is that if we excite to this purple state here, which comes into resonance with the laser, then during the laser pulse, because the molecule can move fast, <clears throat> I can have a nuclear wave function which moves towards this intersection here and couples the purple and the orange electronic states. And if I ionize the molecule after that coupling, then I will produce a molecular cation in a superposition of ionic states that are correlated with these two states. That is the purple and the orange curves up here. And if I wait even longer, I can couple to this green state here. And that will leave me in a superposition of these three ionic states. That is why for a long pulse, we see three peaks in the photoelectron spectrum. Whereas for a short pulse, we only see one peak because there's no time for the wave packet to couple between the surfaces. Now, this is a story. Let me see if I can show you some experimental evidence to back this up. So we did an experiment where we varied with our pulse shaper, the delay between two pulses whose phase was locked. That is, <clears throat> you can see that basically we were just varying the envelope of these two pulses and that their relative phase was locked. Now, so what happens in, oops, I'm going the wrong way. <clears throat> you can imagine that what we do is we excite the molecule and then you can ionize directly from that intermediate resonance state. And that would produce a peak in the photoelectron spectrum like the green one here. If we wait a little bit, then that electronic or that, sorry, that nuclear wave function can move towards the conical intersection and um, spread some population between these two states. That leads to a more complicated photoelectron spectrum that also involves this guy right here. And if we wait even longer, then we can get coupling and population on all three of these and um, lead to an additional peak in the photoelectron spectrum out here corresponding to the ground state of the molecular cation. So we performed an experiment where we did this sort of a pump probe measurement. And what's shown here is the photoelectron spectrum that evolves exactly according to our expectations based on that idea of the wave packet moving and coupling these three electronic states. So <clears throat> you can see here on, on this axis is the time delay between the two pulses. And on this axis is the energy of the photoelectrons. And what you can see is that if we come in with the two pulses having a very short delay, then we excite only a single state of the molecular cation which was corresponding to this resonant intermediate state in the purple. If we wait about 12 femtoseconds, which was exactly the time it took for the wave packet to move over here and couple these two potentials, then you can see that we ionize to a substantial portion of the wave function being coupled to this other orange curve here, which is correlated with the photoelectron or with producing a photoelectron at low energy here. So at zero femtoseconds, we produce this guy. If we wait a little bit longer at around 10 to 15 femtoseconds, we ionize from this orange state and produce a photoelectron with a different energy here. So basically the correlation between ionic and neutral states, plus our understanding of the ionic spectrum and the photoelectron spectrum 
allows us to use the photoelectron spectrum to follow the non-adiabatic dynamics in the neutral molecule. Now, here is the sort of the, the final thing that I really was trying to get to, which is that if we imagine doing an experiment with two pulses and we vary the phase between those two pulses so that we can make an initial wave packet up here that can move and couple between surfaces and have another wave packet launched and ionize from both of those two wave packets with a subsequent laser pulse. That is the second pulse will have to do sort of double duty in a sense of both exciting and ionizing. Then we can study how the phase relationship between the two pulses influences the total yield to these two states. And that allow us to see whether the phase of the wave function is preserved as it is coupled between electronic states. So that's what this measurement is doing. On the right, you will see that I'm gonna show you what is the relative phase between these two pulses. And it's gonna just show you a movie of what we actually programmed under our pulse shaper. And then on the left, you'll see the photoelectron spectrum evolve as a function of that relative phase. So I'll show that movie once more. <clears throat> Oops. And what you'll see here is that we're varying the relative phase between this pulse and this pulse. And the variation in relative phase has significant effects on the photoelectron spectrum. You can see that the peak associated with the first excited state of the cation, that D1, which was corresponding to the purple curve, is optimized for a different phase between pulses than ionization to this D3 or orange curve that we had seen. So A, the fact that there's a dependence on the phase and B, the fact that the two electronic states are optimized for different phases indicates that the phase of the wave function is maintained even despite the non-adiabatic coupling and we can use it to control the total ionization yield. So maybe this is a, a juncture at which I can take additional questions before wrapping up the talk with a few more slides. <clears throat> okay, so we have um, actually just uh, six minutes before one. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm going to prefer to let you uh, get toward the end and then we'll bunch the questions all at the end. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, so there, there's not much I can sort of, I had a, <clears throat> yeah, so I'll, I'll sort of make my way to the last couple of slides now. So this is just showing you now sort of a different view of this same um, experiment. But what you can see here is that the ionization to each of these two states implying interference in the intermediate neutral states is shown in the purple and the yellow or orange curves. And you can clearly see that the yield is not optimized for the same phase. That right away tells you that it can't just be sort of some sort of an optical interference effect, which is taking place because there's some overlap in the pulses and the intensity variations with phase are playing a role. But rather there's really some molecular interference that's taking place because the different channels or different final states have different yields as a function of phase. So now what we can do is we can say, well, let's vary the time delay and measure how the phase variations go. What's the amplitude of the phase variation with time delay? And in a sense, this is exactly measuring fringe visibility in like a Michelson interferometer um, so it's really measuring the coherence time. And um, we can do that for, for instance, this molecule CH2BRI or a similar molecule from this homologous series, CH2BRCL. And what you can see is that <clears throat> those coherence times are on the order of a few tens of femtoseconds. So what that tells you is that the spread of the wave function and the motion on the excited state potential energy surface leads to a decay in the electronic coherence because of averaging over vibrational coordinate. That is, the phase for different vibrational coordinates evolves differently. And if you're measuring some superposition of all of that, or if you're measuring averaging over that vibrational coordinate, then of course the phase information washes out. And it does so on tens of femtosecond timescales. Now this is interesting because for instance, there was a lot of debate in the last few years, let's say 10 or so years, 
about the role of electronic coherence in natural processes, for instance, like photosynthesis, um, where people had made observations of electronic coherence as apparently contributing to <clears throat> um, photosynthetic um, dynamics on sort of hundreds of femtoseconds out to picoseconds of time. And this doesn't seem to be consistent with our measurements and other measurements. And there have been subsequent follow-up measurements that really argue that no, electronic coherence in molecules, particularly larger systems, does really decay on tens of femtoseconds and can't be responsible for driving processes in biology um, or, or, or even you know, solid state um, physics. So um, I think what I'm gonna do is <clears throat> just say a word or two about other experiments that we've carried out, but not really go into detail. The point is that we could, what, we, what I described to you was a rather simple pulse-shaped spectroscopy where we really actually produced two pulses, very much like a traditional pump probe experiment. It's just that we were able to do it with a little bit more control and subtlety than a usual experiment. What we were able to do is independently control the amplitude, delay, and phase, which is very difficult to do with a standard Michelson interferometer. Um, and that really facilitated our um, phase measurements where we could sit at a given delay and vary the phase independent of the delay. But we can do other things. We're actually not limited at all. What we're much more limited by is our ability to interpret the measurements rather than the ability to carry them out. This was just an example of how we can use chirp, that is time varying frequency of a laser pulse to control similar internal conversion dynamics. And what I want to show you here is that for two pulses with identical intensity profile, we can get a very different photoelectron spectrum, which is indicative of how the phase of the pulse cooperates with the phase of the electronic wave function in order to drive resonance um, and <clears throat> or rather to, to drive the ionization to one state or another. Um, and these measurements are now in excellent agreement with solutions to the time dependent Schrodinger equation that we can carry out, which really tell us that we have not just sort of a hand waving understanding of what's going on, but a detailed quantitative understanding. Um, here's a, a detailed picture of what the dynamics can be thought of in terms of, but I'm, I'm going to sort of leave that out in the interest of, of finishing on time. <clears throat> I do want to say that you know, we, you know, for many real hardcore AMO people, as Hal Metcalf also likes to say, you know, what's a molecule is one atom too many, um, but, uh, <clears throat> or a diatomic molecule at any rate. We, we do have our sights set on um, slightly more sort of chemically, biologically relevant molecular systems. And we've started working on a system of ring molecules where you can make substitutions um, thinking about pyrrole, furan, and thiophene, all we're doing is substituting a nitrogen or an NH for an oxygen or a sulfur. And we're able to carry out very similar experiments that we did in the earlier series of molecules. So this is just to motivate the idea that this is a general tool and not just a one trick pony. Um, so with that, I think I should conclude <coughs> and say that um, I'd like to argue that pulse shaped spectroscopy can provide fundamental insights. That is, we can really see that phase can be preserved despite non adiabatic um, coupling between electronic surfaces. And also, I'm very optimistic that pulse shaped spectroscopy can complement traditional pump probe measurements, which are linked together by this fundamental idea that they are essentially just starting studying the response, the nonlinear optical response of some molecular system to a complex shaped pulse. And um, in the case of pump probe, it's a very well-defined and established parameterization. And we're just generalizing that toolbox um, with our ultra-fast pulse shaping. Um, most importantly, perhaps, I want to acknowledge the people who really were instrumental in carrying the work out. Um, Brian Kaufman here, this is what I've told you about is essentially his thesis work. Um, and the work has been in a very strong collaboration with Tomasz Rozgonyi and Philip Markatand at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and the University of Vienna. Um, they carried out a lot of the electronic structure calculations and also worked with us in carrying out the simulations of the time dependent Schrodinger equation. 
So um, thanks a lot for your attention. Um, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to answering any questions. Yeah, the scientific world is silently clapping for you. Um, great, so we have a number of questions. Let me ask the first. Uh, Chris Panda asks, um, could the techniques you're using here be used for um, coherent population transfer, which could maybe be related to um, laser cooling of molecules, <clears throat> or, maybe, or maybe the stitching together of atoms through photosociation? And... Uh, uh, it's a great question. Um, I've thought about that quite a bit. Um, there was a proposal um, many years ago by the group of Ronnie Kozlov to do photo association with chirped laser pulses. And this seemed like a very exciting um, idea at the time, but there are some fundamental reasons why that was actually quite difficult. Um, and I think essentially there's, there's a number of ones that I can articulate. There are some technical ones um, that it's very difficult to generate the kinds of shape pulses that you need exactly for that because they sort of fall into this window of um, sort of nanosecond, picosecond, which is difficult to produce with our techniques. So you, it's hard to get there directly in the time domain. It's hard to get there directly from the frequency domain. But I think more fundamentally, some of the problems came about with that the, essentially the, 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 the kind of up-down process that you needed driven by a chirped ultra-fast laser pulse um, was not favorable for pulsed excitation um, because of the scaling of the Rabi frequency with laser intensity. So, Short pulses are very good for driving processes that are strongly nonlinear, um, but it's not so good if you want to simply, <clears throat> um, you know, sort of capture in coordinate space or an R, a, a, you know, a group of molecules and then transfer them to an excited state and bring them back down. So, so in principle, I think one could imagine that these kinds of techniques should be useful and interesting um, for cold atoms photo association, but it. There have been a number of attempts experimentally. I think Ian Walmsley's group um, uh, carried out some experiments and there were a couple of experiments in Germany. And I think that, and, and also in Israel that I'm aware of, um, but I, I think that it's, it's been hard to compete with, with, with other approaches hmm. in, in that specific yeah. area. Okay, good. The next question, uh, there's actually a number of questions that are all uh, maybe asking for some clarification about what you mean by phase coherence. So, uh, for example, Zhen Dong Zhang, uh, similarly Bill Phillips asks a question, uh, why does the non-adiabaticity possibly lead to decoherence? So landau zener tunneling is a fully coherent process. So could you clarify exactly what you mean? Is it a, is it a coherence that you're just not able to access anymore by your methods? Or, uh, okay, so it's a, it's a great question. Actually, this relates to um, you know, I, there, there is some really nice work that I'm aware of from Shal Mukamal, where he actually thinks about using a conical intersection as a sort of coherent beam splitter for a wave function. So that you might imagine, just like in the movie that I showed you actually right here, right? That you could, uh, sorry, one sec. Ah, why can I not get the movie to play? There we go. You can think about the wave function going through the intersection and um, creating a sort of coherent replica of itself on the ground state, um, what would be necessarily the mechanism for the loss of coherence? I agree that, um, that it's, it's, I don't see any obvious reason why it shouldn't happen. That is, why shouldn't you maintain the coherence? I think you should, but it was just not obvious that you actually will. There are <clears throat> a, certainly a number of, um, I think it wasn't quite appreciated to what extent the coherence is lost just from this idea that I tried to articulate in the very beginning. Um, right here. So in a simple low dimensional picture, I think many things seem clear, right? That here, you know, it seems obvious, at least to my mind, right, that if I have potentials that are very non-parallel, then the phase evolution at this internuclear coordinate is evolving at a very different rate than from right here, right? So then your your the phase is not well defined, and it will be washed out in a very short amount of time. But 
but there was still a significant amount of debate because it seemed like, for instance, in these photosynthetic systems like the Fenn and Matthews Olson complex, that there were actually electronic coherences playing a role. So I think that there was just, I think it was important to establish that it's it's there, but it still decays on a relatively fast time scale, just as you would expect from this kind of a picture. So I think I don't disagree with with Bill and, and the others in in that I don't I can't give you a reason why it should go away, but it's not obvious when you have many degrees of freedom that it should necessarily be maintained, um, given our understanding in a sort of low dimensional cartoon picture. Okay. Okay, so one last question is uh, maybe a bit technical. It comes from our panelist, uh, Adam Kaufman, who is interested in this uh, AOD-based uh, spatial modulator. Um, you, could, you could have used a DMD, you could have used uh, some linear liquid crystal spatial light modulator to maybe achieve similar capabilities. So how would uh, someone choose between these different options? For example, you probably consider right. resolution or the uh, sure, yeah. I mean, actually, band actually, performance in terms of the colors of light. So when I was first a graduate student with Phil Botsbaum, then this was my first job basically to decide which technology we'd go with. So I visited a number of labs and um, eventually went for the acoustic modulator. And the reason is essentially that it is um, <clears throat> transparent over an incredibly large range. So we've done pulse shaping all the way from the deep ultraviolet at around 260 nanometers, all the way to the sort of near infrared. And other people like Martin Zanni have gone all the way to the mid infrared with this, um, because you can find materials that are just transparent. And um, you can get very high resolution and you can get very fast update rates because you're limited only by the acoustic transit time across the modulator. So liquid crystals take much longer to move. Um, and the damage thresholds for these systems are also much higher. So you can work with amplified systems. Um, so there's a number of considerations. There's some competing evolution of other technologies that you know, some of what I said might not be totally true given recent developments, but, but the transparency I think is something that's hard to compete with with regards to AOMs. Also, what's really nice is that you can independently design and build your own driver. So we just you know, bought our own arbitrary waveform generator and can program it ourselves. And then you can sort of do whatever you want, so to speak. Um, and it's very much under your control. You're not limited by some you know, kludgy box that somebody builds and you're using for a completely different purpose than what it was intended for. I see. Great, Tom, thank you so much. Thanks for this talk. Um, let's see, a couple of things. First, if you could uh, stop your sharing and I yeah, will- Yeah, of course. Uh, share an announcement for the coming week. Uh, here it is. Good, so uh, hopefully you can see this. So uh, one point is that um, we have uh, an upcoming um, Vamos talk by Ken Quen Ni next week. So be sure to join for that. In addition, our uh, European sister seminar is uh, taking place the day before on Thursday and Mariana Safranova will be speaking there. So that should also be a very interesting talk. Um, and then secondly, let me encourage everybody to join uh, the uh, post-seminar discussion. And again, we're particularly interested in recreating a setting where uh, students and postdocs and other young scientists have a chance to interact with one another and with a speaker, something that we're kind of missing during the current uh, COVID era. So please consider yourselves all invited to join that uh, session. There were also some questions uh, that we received um, uh, that I didn't have time to ask. So then it would be a great time to pose those questions as well. So I believe that in the chat box, um, you will now see the, I can't see, uh, you'll see the announcement for that uh, post-seminar discussion along with, uh, I guess, the password that you need to get into that room. And that'll happen immediately right now. So you can go ahead and uh, log out of this window and go into that other Zoom room. So thanks everybody. See you next week. <laughs>